three, two, one. Excellent. The most repeated sentence on Zoom. Can everybody see my screen? All right, guys. So uh, very first thing I want to do is uh, have an introduction video, which was filmed previously. So here we are. Oh, sorry, one sec. That's the one. Hi, my name is Christian Cardoso, and I'm the lead instructor for Medlytics this year, 2022. In Medlytics, which is short for medical analytics, we teach students to apply machine learning to real medical problems. Things like predicting hypothyroidism in patients, using brain signals to classify sleep stages, and spotting cancer from mammogram images. Using these problems, we can motivate and demonstrate a wide variety of machine learning approaches. Decision trees, support vector machines, neural networks, these students have been through it all, and now it all culminates at the end of the summer with their final presentations. So congratulations, and let's go ahead and have them present. And with that, congratulations from Christian Live. And also, let's go ahead and start with uh, group six, the Funky Monkeys. Hopefully they have it on their slides so I don't look crazy calling them the Funky Monkeys. I swear they, they, they call themselves this. All right, hello everyone. Welcome to our final Medlytics 2022 presentation, our classifier for the disease monkeypox. I'm Tall and I'm joined by... Shivani. Hi, Ray. And Neoti. In our presentation today, we'll give a brief overview of the disease monkeypox, the pre-processing for our data, our binary and multi-class classifier, the web application we developed, and as well as conclusions we've come up with. Now, first, I would like to give a brief overview of the disease monkeypox. Now, I'm sure all of you guys have heard about monkeypox already, but for those of you who don't know what it is, it is a zoonotic disease similar to smallpox, chickenpox, cowpox, etc. It does not respond to vaccinations for smallpox, and there are already two forms of vaccination produced, Genios and Akam 2000. Both vaccines are already approved by the FDA. The U.S. has purchased 7 million vaccines already and are offering to higher-risk individuals. The current strain of monkeypox we're seeing today started five years ago in Nigeria with an 11-year-old boy who had sores in his mouth and skin. Now, the mortality rate for monkeypox is uh, three to six percent. Next slide, please. Okay, so the mortality rate is three to six percent and there are two to four weeks of infection. The common symptoms include fever, fatigue, aches, chills, and rashes, and it spreads by contact with rashes, scratch by or by eating an infected animal, sexual contact, or pregnancy. Now, as of August 4th, the White House has declared monkeypox a public health emergency around the nation. On the left here is a graph showing the daily confirmed cases around the world, the pattern clearly on the rise, and on, right, on the right is a map from the CDC showing the most targeted locations for monkeypox, with the USA and Spain being hit the hardest. Worldwide, there are 25,000 cases reported, with the US taking the lead with 6,000 currently reported cases. Next, we'll be talking about how we appropriately pre-process the data for training, validation, and testing. Uh, so we decided to split up into two data sets, one for binary and one for multi-class. So the binary data set was from Kaggle, and it simply labeled the images as monkeypox and non-monkeypox. And our split for this one was 60% for training, 28% for validation, 12% for testing. Uh, in an effort to increase our images, we added in another normal skin data set um, for the negative monkeypox. And then for multi-class, we decided to merge uh, different data sets together. So we merged a data set from GitHub and uh, Kaggle. And as a result, we had images labeled as chickenpox, measles, monkeypox, and normal. And our split for this one was 60% training, 20% validation, and 20% testing. Um, in order to randomize the order of the data, uh, we shuffled and concatenated data in a random order. Uh, we also decided to augment our data to increase the number of image, images we were training on. Uh, and you can also see the image count uh, in the bottom right. Uh, next, we'll be talking about the binary classifier. For our binary model architecture, we use transfer learning, which is a method that transfers a pre-existing trained model into our own model as a starting point, increasing classification accuracy. Specifically, we used efficient net V3, which scales our model dimensions. We had two dropout layers, which randomly changed some inputs to zero to prevent overfitting. Our dropout rate for both layers was 0 0.6. We used a flattened layer, which flattened the data fed to the output layer. 
we also incorporated two dense layers, which are fully connected layers that receive neuron outputs and thus increase complexity of the neural network. With a learning rate of 0.0001, we used the Atom Optimizer, which uses stochastic gradient descent to optimize our model. Further, we ran our model for 40 epochs. As you can see, we set our first dense layer, dense 18, to 128 neurons, and our second to 64 neurons. Our output layer, dense 20, had one neuron. For our dense layers, we used ReLU as our activation function, and finally, we used sigmoid as the function for our output layer. With all of these parameters, our model produced a loss of 0.019 and an accuracy of 0.9946. To the right is the ROC curve, which defines the relationship between a true positive rate and a false, false positive rate. We had an ROC of roughly 0.6016, which unfortunately is not very good, you can see that the curve travels quite closely along the linear line, which is not quite what we want. However, there are other metrics that are equally as important that show more promising results. Our precision, which quantifies the number of true positives that belong to the classified positive set, had a weighted average of 0.75. Recall, which quantifies the number of true, positive, true positives that belong to the actual positive class, had that of 0.77. The F1 score, which is simply the mean of precision and recall, had a weighted value of 0.76. So let's talk about how our multi-class model was constructed. Initially, to feed the images into the neural network, we tried to use convolutional neural network layers, which essentially take in the raw image and apply filters to extract the useful aspects of the feature. In our case, the edges of the monkeypox postules. However, that did not lead to high accuracy scores, so we decided to use transfer learning. We used DenseNet 1 to 1, a transfer learning model that fully connects each convolutional layer, optimizing recognition of useful features in our data that can help the model identify monkeypox accurately. Aside from transfer learning, we used batch normalization, um, which essentially normalizes data to the same size and shape. Elim eliminating size and shape as variables for the neural network to train on. We also used dropout layers, dense layers, and a flattened layer. Uh, our first dense layer had 128 neurons, our second one had 32, and our output dense layer had four neurons. Uh, we trained our model for 100 epochs, um, shuffling our data after each one. And since our data was passed through our neural network 100 times, the model became pretty adept at recognizing the differences between monkeypox, chickenpox, and normal skin. Our learning rate was 0.0001, and our loss function was categorical cross-entropy, which is commonly used in multi-class classification neural networks. Our dropout rate was 0.6, optimizer was atom like the binary model, and we used softmax activation function for the output layer, and ReLU for all the other layers. After all of this, we had a model accuracy of 84.1%, a model loss of 0.449, and an area under the receiving oper operating, receiver operating characteristics curve of 0.968. Um, on the left of the screen, we see the ROC curve. The orange curve corresponds to chicken pox, the green one corresponds to measles, and the blue one corresponds to um, the, the blue one corresponds to monkeypox. There are also other metrics that we found. So our precision was 0.88, our recall was 0.86, and our F1 score was 0.87. Now we're going to move on to talk about the web app construction, but I would encourage you to look away for the next two slides if you are a bit squeamish, because there are a couple of disturbing images of monkeypox on these slides. And so if you are squeamish, I would encourage you to look away. Yeah, so we decided to um, develop a web app so users can easily use our model without having any knowledge of Python or how notebooks really work. Um, so for this task, we decided to utilize Anvil. And Anvil is basically a platform for building and hosting these web apps where the backend is uh, written in Python. So we use Anvil as our uh, front end for all of our um, UI. And then on our back end, uh, everything was hosted on DeepNote. And uh, basically how Anvil and DeepNote um, interact with each other is um, they're connected through a WebSocket. 
And between the two, um, the, the HTTP requests are sent and processed, which allows um, the user to upload images and see the result uh, from the model as well. So now we'll be showing like a quick demo for, for the binary classifier. So our binary classifier classifies as um, monkeypox positive or monkeypox negative. So we first um, uploaded a picture of monkeypox of a person who is monkeypox positive. And as shown here, the model splits out, spits out monkeypox positive. And then now we're gonna upload a picture of a normal hand. And that came out monkeypox negative. And finally, one picture of someone with monkey, I'm sorry, chicken pox. Um, and that came out monkeypox negative. Next, we have the multi-class app. Uh, yeah, and here's our web app, web app classifier for multi-class. Um, we're classifying skin images as monkeypox, chickenpox, and normal skin. Um, here's an image of normal skin, and it classifies the output as um, uh, normal. And it also outputs a vector showing the probabilities out of one of the image belonging to each of the different classes. Um, over here is an image of chickenpox, and the model outputs chickenpox. And lastly, we're going to upload an image of monkeypox, and it shows monkeypox. Okay, if I told you to look away, you can look back now. Now we're going to um, go through some conclusions that we had for our presentation. So for some challenges that we had overall, like when we were working on the models, first we had a couple of corrupted packages that caused us a bit of an issue. So when we installed Anvil, we installed the wrong package. So we installed Anvil instead of Anvil uplink. And as a result, we corrupted our TensorFlow package. And because of that, we had to duplicate our notebooks and change our Python environment, downgrading from 3.9 to 3.8. We also had a couple of problems with our binary AORC. As Ira said earlier, our area under the curve for the binary model wasn't the greatest, even though we had an accuracy of 0.99, our area under the curve was 0 0.60. And as a result, um, we looked at other um, at other like metrics to, um, in order to understand how good our binary model was doing. Um, for next steps for our project, we plan to turn our research into a paper and submit it to a journal for publication. And we also hope to include um, to improve our data quality since at the time this data set was created, which was two months ago, most of the data from monkeypox was in Africa since the um, since the monkeypox like since most monkeypox cases were concentrated in Africa, and as a result, there might be a potential bias against skin color. Thank you so much for listening, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask them now. Excellent, thank you guys. Beautiful. We have two minutes for questions that people would like to post to the uh, to the question and answer session. So somebody asked, how would your program deal with poor lighting in a submitted image? I think our model is trained on um, a lot of different lighting conditions. Um, and also we go through like a pre-processing step, um, which should like account for that lighting. But uh, it's like it's still kind of depending because if some prominent features are not like shown in the image, Right, if the image is too dark, where like the rashes are not shown because it's too dark, um, and like you've lost that data, then it's almost impossible to like detect whether monkeypox is there or not. But I think we tried our best to kind of like modify the images and uh, augment them in such a way that lighting doesn't play as much of a role. Yeah, to add on to that, I think. That since most of our data was web scraped, actually all of it was web scraped. So because of that, we um, we have like a variety of images, and the augmentations helps too in like being able to um, being able to have images of different qualities in terms of lighting. Excellent. We have no more questions, and it looks like we've hit up time. So let's go ahead and move on. Thank you, guys. We'll uh, give our best round of physical and virtual applause. And we went over to uh, team number five. I don't remember if team number five has a name, they might, but they will be presenting live. So let's have team five over. There's Catherine. All right, team five, ready when you are. 
Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to present here. Um, this is our final project from Metalytics, uh, Speak Your Mind. And this is a project where we developed an algorithm to screen depression using textual data and vocal features. Uh, our team members today are... Akshay. Catherine. David. Lucy. Sanjana. And Yuri. So a brief overview of what we're gonna be going through today. So we're gonna walk you through how we found our data set, how we constructed our model and our algorithm and how we tested it. And step three is uh, something that we worked on specifically to get an application running, a web application to apply this in a practical usage. And finally, any next steps and conclusions that we drew from our project. So the topic of mental health is something that's widely discussed and it's a widespread problem across the board. According to WHO, 26, 264 million people are depressed worldwide as of last year. And depression has many other risks associated with it, including health risks and a steep cost on loss of productivity. So keeping this in mind, this was our focus in figuring out an algorithm to make this problem and somehow contribute to it to make it better in the world. So the current form of screening we have for depression are questionnaires that are filled out by the patients. The problem with these questionnaires is that they're time consuming for large populations. And this is where a majority of the backlash on screening comes from. And these questionnaires are also not objective because they are filled out by the patients themselves. So our project goal is to figure out a more objective way to screen depression by using vocal features to supplement these questions. And the importance of the algorithm is that it gives quick results leading to quick action. And one thing to keep in mind is that the algorithm only scans for the risk of depression and not confirmed medical diagnosis, which would require a full-time uh, experienced doctor. And now we'll, we'll talk about how we found our data set. So something we realized early on is that there are a lack of data sets out there on depression, but something that was open source that we found was something called ET Corpus, which stands for Emotional Audio Textual Depression Corpus. And this is from a Chinese study. And this data set had audio and text transcriptions of depressed and non-depressed volunteers answering a questionnaire, which was commonly used by psychologists to screen for depression. And the data collection consisted of three interview questions, so positive, negative, and neutral, and then collecting the audio responses from the patients. And then there was a label that was a score for depression severity, which we turned into a binary label for either depressed or not depressed. So this is an example of the audios. So there's a positive, negative, and neutral, and these are the translated transcripts because everything was in Chinese. <laughs> And that was the transcript. Next, we start developing our model, and the first step to do so is to process our data. Um, in each sample, uh, there were three audio clips, positive, negative, and neutral, uh, which correspond to the different questions that each person answered from the original questionnaire. Uh, next, we iterated through each of the, through each of the files, uh, extracting features from the audio clips. Um, then we created a correlation heat map and uh, listed each of the correlations in descending order. Um, through the use of this heat map and the addition of um, trial and error, uh, we found the features that described the data well and removed those which didn't. Um, this is the data frame that we ended up with, uh, where the columns are the features that are being fed into the model, and the rows are each entry. So we tested four models in total, logistic regression, SVM, random forest, and KNN. And for our final model, we decided to use KNN. Instead of focusing only on validation accuracy to pick the best model, we tried to focus on both the confusion matrix score and the validation accuracy. This is why although logistic regression and the SVM model both have high validation accuracy rates compared to KNN, they weren't chosen for the final model because both confusion matrix scores predicted zero for the true positive rate. 
And this is important because zero for the true positive rate means that the algorithm cannot identify any patients with depression correctly. The KNN, however, has five for the true positive rate, which means that the KNN can identify patients with depression, and it doesn't predict no, no depression for every patient. So what is KNN and how does it work? Nearest Neighbors is an algorithm that classifies the data by finding one or more points that have similar features. And KNN is basically the same as the nearest neighbors, except it classifies the data based on a majority vote of the K nearest neighbors. So as you could see from the image on the left, if K is equal to one, then the algorithm will classify as a blue square. While when K is equal to three, the algorithm will classify as a red triangle because the red triangle is a majority of the three nearest neighbors. The image on the right is our actual code for KNN. And after trying multiple different values for the number of nearest neighbors, um, five was the optimal one that prints out the highest accuracy rate. All right, so you may remember from the beginning that our project involves extracting features from both audio and text files. So my teammates have talked a lot about how we extract features from audio files. Natural language processing is the method we use um, to do the same for text. So one is NLP or natural language processing. Well, it's essentially another data processing algorithm um, that will take features from text and use that to classify uh, certain documents. And in our case, we use that to classify the transcripts of our audio recordings into either risk of depression or no risk of depression. So there are two primary methods for NLP. Um, the first one is the most widespread method because of its simplicity, which is called bag of words. Essentially how it works is it will take a document and it will create a bag of words using every single word in that document and an associated count, which is the number of times it appears. So onto the next slide, you can see that we can use those counts and by graphing uh, on the x-axis a number that's associated with that unique word, and then the y-axis, it's number of times it appeared in the document. We can actually use a machine learning algor algorithm to separate those um, words into different categories. So this is how we implemented it. We took the text file, as you can see on the left, this is um, a combination of all the different transcripts in our data frame. Uh, we turned that into a bag of words, which is uh, essentially an array that uh, creates an uh, array of like import importances or counts for each word. Uh, we fed that bag of words into a logarithmic regression model, which gave us the results on the right, uh, a confusion matrix of 18050 and an accuracy of around 78%. Another method of NLP that we tried is called word embeddings, which is where every word is com uh, converted to a pre-trained numerical representation of its meaning. So in the visualization, you can see on the right, uh, similar words are closer together. After the text is converted to word embeddings, it's fed into a recurrent neural network, which trains on the data, and it's used to make predictions on other textual data. For our word embedding model, our training accuracy was 99%, and our validation accuracy was 80% which meant the model overfit. And that means that the model wasn't making generalized enough predictions and it was making predictions too fit to the training data. Okay, now we'll discuss our web application. So we used an open source app framework in Python called Streamlit. And this is a screenshot of what it would look like. And this is all run on your local server. So for this web app, the input is basically going to be a recording of 10 seconds or it's just gonna be audio that you can upload on your own. And then it goes through the processing, which is basically you upload the audio file, which is in a WAV format, and then you calculate the audio features and then feed the data into our KNN model. And then the output will be the generated prediction. So zero for negative and one for positive. And this is a demo. So first we upload the negative file, which is just like a negative sounding response, which will screen for depression. And then next will be the positive one, which is a bit more light in the audio. So the result is you may not be depressed. Okay, so here are some of our feature endeavors. 
So some things we can do in the future to improve are finding a larger data set so we have more data to train on. We could also use facial features to help diagnose depression. We could also feed the audio signals through a convolutional network, which could help uh, reduce the dimensionality of the time series data. We could also find more correlated features and combine the natural language processing with the audio features to create uh, better predictions. Thank you for Thank your time you. today, and we're ready for questions right now. Okay, so team five, I'm going to look over at the uh, Q&A. Here we go. All right, so question from Anonymous. Since the data set you guys used was in Chinese, how did you ensure that the response weren't this responses weren't distorted by faulty translations, or was the model trained directly on the responses in Chinese? It's a good question. So um, I think it's definitely a concern for the natural language processing part of it. Um, we actually used a built-in Python library to translate most of them. Um, I wouldn't say it's a concern for the audio features, just because those features are extracted directly from the actual um, vocal signals and not from like the tax, so it shouldn't be based on language. Okay, any other questions on the chat? Let's see. Someone said, does your program check only for words or for tone as well? Uh, definitely for tone as well. So we have two separate parts. So the words will be the natural language processing, which David sort of mentioned just now. Um, but we also check for tone and that's kind of like individualized per sample. So we're not like comparing between samples, but looking at one audio file and then checking those features and how they're kind of shaped. And based on that and some spectral features, uh, which thanks to Christian, we learned in class, um, um, we use that and then basically screen for depression from there using a model. So it's really cool. In, in theory, if this were in one unified language from the start, then you could kind of weigh the two different models together but you were faced with an interesting task, which was half of it was <laughs> in Chinese. Um, so it's amazing what you guys made out of, out of this as well. All right, I think with that, we will finish team five forever. Bye-bye team five, thank you guys. And now we will go off to team number four. Well-dressed and prepared as ever, here they come. Okay, uh, let me know when you can see that. Okay, hi everyone, good morning, um, we are AI from the Medlytics course. My name is Ashripa. I'm Jean. I'm Nihita. I'm Pratham. And I'm Yuti. Okay, so this is just a general overview of what we're gonna be going over in our presentation. So first we'll start off by talking about our mission statement, then we will go into how we pre-processed our data, followed by what models we used and challenges we may have faced, and finally, a conclusion of results and future steps. So let's start off with a brief introduction. So our project idea was to create a model with the intention of diagnosing ocular diseases. Using multi-class classification, it sorts ocular fundus images into eight different categories, which are seven diseases plus one normal label, meaning no diagnosis. And using binary classification, it sorts ocular fundus images into two categories, which are just normal and abnormal. So we went through with this project idea because we thought not only would it be most beneficial to people, but it's easily accessible and much more convenient than the process and expenses of a traditional MRI scan. Like Ashrita said, we are classifying ocular diseases into eight different categories, which are as follows. Diabetic retinopathy, which is an eye condition complication of diabetes caused by blood vessel damage. Glaucoma, which is caused by damage to the optic nerve due to high pressure. Cataracts, which is blurry vision caused by the clouding of the clear lens of the eye. And the fourth category is age-related macular degeneration, or vision loss caused by the de deterioration of the retina. The fifth category is hypertension, and it is a condition where the blood pressure within the eye is higher than 140 by 90. Lastly, the sixth category is pathological myopia, which is a short-sightedness caused by deterioration. Finally, we have a category for other diseases, which is a miscellaneous category. And we have one last category for the normal diagnosis, meaning there is no disease detected. Now we will cover how we pre-processed our data. Ocular Disease Intelligent Recognition is a structured database of 5,000 patients with age, color fundus photographs from left and right eyes, and doctors diagnostic keywords. These were classified into eight labels or diseases, which were previously mentioned by Pratham. 
Now, because of our large data set, we had to take some measures to quicken the runtime of our program. We resized all the optical fundus images so they were considerably smaller and were all the same dimensions. Fundamental concept in the Metalytics course was neural networks. A neural network is a series of algorithms that attempts to recognize patterns in a set of data by mimicking the human neuronal system. Neural networks can be optimized by tampering with kernels, layers, inputs, outputs, and weights, which improves the accuracy. Now let's talk about transfer learning. This is the application of artificial knowledge gained from completing one task to help solve another similar task. Think about it like applying background knowledge to different concepts. Next, let's talk about layers. A layer receives the weighted input from the previous layer and passes these values as an output to the next layer. Before passing it on, it transforms the input with a set mostly nonlinear functions. All right, now let's follow up on what June said. So there are different kinds of layers and we're gonna talk about the ones that we used. So activation layers control how well the model learns the training data. Output layers are the final layer where predictions are received. RELU, which stands for rectified linear unit and it prevents exponential growth. Softmax is an activation function in the output layer and it predicts a multinomial probability. And lastly, sigmoid, which applies the sigmoid function to the input so that the output is a numerical value between zero and one. The last important word we'll cover is epochs. An epoch is one complete pass or round of the training data set through the algorithm. Now, now let's, let's discuss the models we use. Throughout this entire week, we tested random forest, convolutional neural networks, ResNet 50, Inception version 3, Inception ResNet version 2, and VGG 16. So the first model we tried was a random forest for multi-classification -classif image, multi-image classification. Random forest is a classification algorithm that uses a series of decision trees to train the model. We yielded very poor results and only ended up with 17% accuracy. So we decided to move on to further algorithms. The next model we tried was CNN or a convolutional neural, neural network for binary classification because it's the most popular neural network model for images. We ended up using three convolutional 2D layers and three max pooling layers. We also played around with the activation layers and ended up alternating between TAN, H, and sigmoid because those seem to provide the best results. We had softmax as our output layer and in the end, our accuracy was 60%. We still weren't happy with this, so we decided to move on to transfer learning. So the first transfer learning model we tried was Inception ResNet V2 for multi-class classification. From this model, we got an area under the curve or AUC of 0.816 and an accuracy of 43.7%. This was a huge improvement for us in terms of the AUC, but we still thought we could go for um, a higher accuracy. After this, we moved on to our next transfer learning model, which was Inception V3 for multi-class classification. We used 20 epochs and ended up with an AUC of 0.755 and an accuracy of 41.7%. So we actually went back a step and need to try something else. These were our final models and results. So the final transfer learning model that we tried for binary classification was ResNet 50. So we saw that it was the most compatible and also researched to be among the four best image classification models and therefore decided to try it. So we used 20 epochs and our area under the curve was 0.7. Most similar work in the field of classifying ocular diseases only classifies between normal vision and cataracts. So we decided to broaden the spectrum and classify seven diseases with multi-class. So as a result of balancing the data, the zero roll algorithm showed an accuracy of about 50%. And compared to that, our 70% is a pretty good result, also considering the fact that this model is probably gonna be used for more general purposes. Uh, the final model we tried was VGG16 for multi-class classification. Our AUC for VGG16 was 0.847, which was our uh, best yet. Um, we used 20 epochs and had a learning rate of 0.00013. So in order to make our model more accessible to users, we decided a web app would be the best option, and this is the prototype we constructed. 
Because of time constraints, our website isn't fully functional yet, but how it works is basically the user would put an image of an eye like this one, and then they would get an output telling them what type of disease they have, if any. Uh, lastly, as a team, we'd probably like to talk about our goals for the future. So one of our main goals with our model is to ensure that our work is being communicated to others. So soon we hope to publish our results so that we can get our research and work out in the real world. Next, we want to focus on the overall accessibility. Our website should be more accessible and convenient, as accessibility for all people was part of our mission statement. Last but not least, we will always continue to fine-tune our model. There is always room for improvement, so we will work on improving our accuracy to achieve the best test results. And this is all we have to present to you guys today. Thank you so much for bearing with us, and we as a team thoroughly enjoyed sh sharing what we've been working on throughout this course. And now we'd like to open the floor to any questions. All right, well done, you guys. You say thank you for bearing it with us, but it's not really bearing. This is this is enjoyable anyway. Uh, let's see if what's showing up on the uh, on the chat. Are there any any questions on the uh, Q and A? Yes. Someone says. Uh, yeah, so, what's one difficulty you ran into with the data, and also, do you see your model being used by medical professionals? I can answer that. So. Probably not yet by medical professionals, just because I feel like a 70% accuracy wouldn't be like exactly what you could use in the real world, but we would want to like try to better that. And in terms of like challenges, so when we were pre-processing our data, not every person had images of both eyes. So the first point was that we had to make each eye into a specific data point. And then after that, we had to resize the images because not all of them would filter through. So, and we also had a bias, I guess, because I mean, if you have more than one like disease and there's multiple points with that disease, then your predictions are going to be most likely to get that. Yeah, adding on to that about the data points. So we saw that not all patients had like two images because obviously everyone has two eyes. So it was either we had to go in and manually filter them out, which I'm not trying to go through a spreadsheet of data and like delete rows for hours. It was either that or take each individual eye as individual data points, which may have screwed with our accuracy. Beautiful. All right. Any closing questions before we take off? Okay. All right, you guys. Thank you. Well done. And uh, unlike the ocular disease group from last year, you guys did not run out of RAM. So I think that in itself is a massive accomplishment. Well done. All right. So now... We are going off to group number three. And group number three is not live. Group number three is via a pre recorded video presentation. So give me one second. I will share. Hello, everyone. We are part of the Medletics program, and our project is based on classifying dyslexia based on handwriting. This project is presented by Amishi, Tyler, Ritwick, Angel, Isha, and Netta. We're going to outline the steps we took to create this project and how we built our model. So first, what is dyslexia? Dyslexia is a general term for disorders that affects your writing, speaking, reading, and spelling skills, impacting a student's ability to read and write. This is why it's important that it's diagnosed and treated early. Our strategy is to generate and optimize a machine learning model that can classify if an individual is likely to have dyslexia in order to initiate further potential consultations. And our aim is to create an application using our machine learning model to predict if an individual has dyslexia based on their handwriting. We're not know what data are we using. We found a data on card with over 200,000 images on handwritten characters. There were research that shows that kids writing letters in reverse can be an dyslexia. Images in the data set were classified into three classes. Printed images are pieces of classes written with really messy handwriting. Normal classes are pieces of characters that are very legible, and reverse characters, pieces of uh, characters are written in reverse. Before we can train our model, we must first pre process our data. The image of data set are written with black, black, and white test, which is the other since we usually write with black ink on white paper. We also randomly rotate the characters by 10 degrees clockwise and counterclockwise, because some people don't write with perfect handwriting, it allows our model to be more general with our data set. Finally, we understand both data by having images in a training set, have the same number of images as a normal class. In this way, the model will be less biased because it can just the images to be corrected more often than other classes due to there being a higher probability with the whole data set. 
What machine learning models do we use and how did we use them? How did we evaluate those models? Well, first we looked at accuracy. Then we also looked at a confusion matrix, an example of which is shown on the left. As you can see, it shows how many predictions were classified to the correct class and how many to the incorrect class. Finally, we looked at the ROC curve or the receiver operating characteristic curve, an example graph of which you can see on the right. The goal is to increase the area under this orange curve called the AUC or the area under the curve. These are the models we tried out. One of the models we used was k-means. How does this model work? Well, in, in this video, you can see how it works. As you can see, we have centroids, the color squares, and they classify the dots around them. As the model learns from its errors, we get better and better clusters. To the left of the video, you can see a graph displaying number of clusters relative to validation accuracy. As you can see, we tried all sorts of amounts of clusters, but could not achieve an accuracy higher than 53%. This is because the images in our data set aren't easily clusterable, making this model ineffective. We also tried a random forest. What is a random forest? Well, it is a combination of multiple decision trees, an example of which you can see on the right. As you can see in the image, a decision tree essentially asks specific questions and creates various branches based on the answers. The answers on the very bottom, to buy or not to buy, are the classes we predict. To find the best type of parameters for this model, we used something called randomized search CV, which tried random combinations of values for the parameters to find the one with the best accuracy. We ended up with an average accuracy of 83%. We also tried neural network models that we learned from methods. For a brief explanation, neural networks consist of three layers, the input, hidden, and output layer. Data gets feed into the input layer, and which turns on and off certain neurons in the hidden layer, and the output there gives its prediction on the data, which in our case is classification, classification on Delestio. A convolutional neural network, or CNN, uses of convolutional layers that are placed between input and hidden layer that takes the image and applies a convolution on it to produce a certain set of images called filters that extract a certain feature from the image. Finally, we use transfer learning, which is about using another CNN model that was trained on a different data set on our data set. These models are often larger and more complex than regular CNN models. Here is the first CNN model we tested, which is LENet5. One of the earliest CNN models are developed to identify high-rated zip code numbers, which is similar to our data set, which is of alphabets. I see what is GIF. Its architecture hyperers are on the white as well. The model produced an accuracy of 87%, which is better than the random forest, but we want a higher accuracy. So we looked at transfer learning models instead. So one of the transfer learning models we looked at was Inception V3, which is a pre-trained model that is also a convolutional neural network. This model's architecture is similar to the VGG16 model. Because the Inception V3 has to have at least 75 by 75 image size input, this model resulted in low resolution images contributing to not that great of an accuracy. So another model that we tried was the VGG16, which is also a pre-trained model that contains similar parameters to the Inception V3 model. This model performs really well with image classification, which is why we decided to try this transfer learning model on our data set. After training and testing all the models, we were able to determine that this model was the best. This model utilized the pre-processed data that allowed the data to look more realistic in the sense that the data was depicted on a white background with black hidden and written letters. The VGG16 model also avoided overfitting. As you can see, the training and validation accuracy are very similar. The confusion matrix and the ROC curves are depicted towards the bottom of the pyramid. So for this project, we decided to collaborate with the Children's Dyslexia Center's director in order to see how applicable our model was in the real world. The director was really helpful because she educated us on letter reversal and the occurrence in younger individuals. She stated that letter reversal can occur in younger individuals without dyslexia, but not all the individuals with dyslexia perform letter reversal. We took this advice and added a disclaimer to our model, which recommended that the user of our web app must be above the age of seven for the results to be more accurate. This is, be this is because it is somewhat common for kids under the age of seven to rewrite in reverse letters. Yep, so here's our abnormal spacing algorithm. Uh, we used OpenCV uh, to create contours around letters, and we uh, found that centers of those contours and found the distance between those. 
on the graph in the bottom right, we see the change in the change in the position of the contour centers. And as you can see, because um, that graph is around zero for the first few letters, um, distance is relatively equal. And for the last two peaks, we can see like for E and R, those are farther apart and those are more dyslexic uh, tendencies. Although I wrote this and it's not dyslexia, so that's great. So now we have a short demo of our web app, which we built with Flask. So you could see the first image it classifies is a reverse K that we drew and it corrects it correctly. Next is gonna be a reverse F. I guess right. And now we drew a normal Q, gets it right. And lastly, from our test set, um, uh, we have a sample from the corrected class, which you can see it's gonna be a corrected R and it gets it right. In the future, we hope to add more features, uh, including more detection for features in dyslexia handwriting, for example, abnormal mix of upper and lowercase letters. And we uh, hope to continue collaborating with the Children's Dyslexia Centers uh, so that we can learn from them. And we hope to add more data sets of MRI scans to improve accuracy and add MRI scans as also a feature for detecting dyslexia. And fourth, we want to provide a mobile application with a friendlier and more versatile user interface. Thank you for listening and please feel free to contact this email regarding any questions. Beautiful, all right. That was uh, group number three. I didn't know what you guys had done about the contours. That was mind blowing. Wow, I, I, I didn't see that part while you guys were working. All right, so thank you group number three. We will now move on to group number two, which also has opted to go with straight video. So give me one sec to pull that up. Hi, we made a Parkinson's progression predictor and our group cons consists of Christine, Daniel, Hershey, Shreya, Sreja, and Tim. So what is our project? The goal of our project was to build a machine learning model that would be able to accept voice recordings of Parkinson patients and return their UPDRS score. We first created and trained our model learning model, then built an app that implemented our model so that Parkinson patients would be able to track the progression of their disease. So the table of contents, our presentation will be broken up into five parts background, data, models, app, and a conclusion. So first we'll go over our background. So what is Parkinson's? Parkinson's is a, is a progressive disorder that affects the central nervous system. Patients often experience symptoms such as tremors, loss of coordination, and more. However, some of the first indicators of Parkinson's are changes in the voice, like becoming quiet, hoarse, etc. Um, what is a UPDRS score? So the UPDRS score, or the Unified Parkinson Disease Rating Scale, measures the severity of Parkinson's. The motor UPDRS score factors in motor, motor skills, while, while the final UPDRS score also takes in behavioral patterns. Essentially, the higher a person's UPDRS score is, the more severe their Parkinson's progression is. So why does this matter? As of right now, there's neither a cure nor any practical diagnostic lab test for Parkinson's. Therefore, it's crucial that doctors can track the patient's disease progression so that they can properly give some sort of therapy. However, insufficient resources and awareness make this task difficult. Our model accepts an audio file and calculates an accurate prediction of the patient's motor and total UPDRS scores. The implementation of a web app makes our model accessible, allowing patients to track the progression of their condition from their own homes. There's also, this is also optimal for patients without easy access to healthcare. Okay, now a little bit about our data. Our data came from the Parkinson's telemonitoring data set found in the UCI machine learning repository. This data was collected via phone call from 42 subjects with Parkinson's over six months. In total, we have 5,875 samples. The data includes several voice features extracted from voice recordings of sustained phonations of the vowel A. Ah. The data set also included the motor UPDRS and total UPDRS scores of each patient at the time of each recording, so we constructed our model to predict those two scores based on the given features. As stated previously, the data set contains a number of different features extracted from the audio recordings. In addition to the subject's age and sex, there are a total of 16 features extracted from the audio recordings. The first few features were jitter types, these are measures of variation in the fundamental frequency of the recordings. 
The Schumer types measure the variation in the amplitudes. NHR and HNR are two measures of the ratio of the noise to tonal components. RPDE is a nonlinear dynamical complexity measure. DFA is a signal fractal signal scaling exponent, and PPE is a nonlinear measure of fundamental frequency variation. Now about our models. So for our performance metrics. The R squared scores the proportion of the variance in our predictions that is predictable from the input features. Mean absolute error is the average distance between the predicted output and the actual output. Mean squared error is the average of the squared errors. Uh, for models, we uh, there's a linear regression model, a random forest model, a neural network. So a neural network is composed of a series of artificial neurons that attempt to recognize underlying relationships in a set of data through iteration. Neural networks are not typically used for a regression problem like ours, but rather classif classification problems. We also had the SVR algorithm and the k-nearest neighbors algorithm, which averages the values of the k-closest data points in the input's vicinity. Our final model used XGBoost, which is an implementation of the gradient boosted trees algorithm. Gradient boosting attempts to accurately predict a target variable by combining the estimates of a set of simpler, weaker models. In this case, the weak learners are regression trees. XGBoost minimizes a convex loss function and a penalty for model complexity. During training, new trees are added iteratively and then combined to make the model's final prediction. Um, out of the 19 features available in the dataset, we ended up selecting the following 13 features listed to use in our model. Reducing the number of features hopefully results in a simpler model and reduces training time. So at the beginning of our process, we tried all the models that were previously mentioned. And after initial testing, we decided not to use the models to sit above because they just gave us relatively low R squared values. And while the K and N model performed well, we decided to against it because it was complex and required a lot of computing power compared to our final model. So the final model that we decided upon was the XG Boost model, and this was simply because it had the best performance metrics out of all the models we, models we tried. In our data pre-processing, we split the data by sex, so we received two sets of metrics. The female R squared value was 0.91, and the male R squared value was 0.9, both of which are pretty good scores. And while looking at the, while we looked at the other metrics, we mainly focused on the R squared values. But to give a quick rundown, we're just looking for a high R squared value where one would be the highest and low values for the rest. So we first normalize or scale the data to values between negative 1 and 1, and basically this mitigates the impact of any variation or extreme data points while also maintaining the general distribution of the data. And after tinkering with the parameters of the model, we determined the following were the most optimized model, or the most optimized models, and you can see them listed above here. And these are just three of the many parameters that were part of the XG Boost model, so further improvement definitely is possible. Um, our app. Uh, one of the main challenges we had when developing the app was determining how we would extract features from a raw audio file. The training data set didn't um, actually provide the audio recordings, but rather several extracted features. We had to find out how the features were extracted in order to pass new input into the model. Um, there also wasn't much uh, information about the parameters of each feature extractor and the pre-processing steps. However, we also uh, used the same underlying speech analysis software, uh, Pratt, through Parcelmouth, a Python library. It allows us to extract the harmonics to noise ratio, all of the jitter features, and uh, all the shimmer features present in the data set. Part of the reason we didn't have extractors for the other four features was because methods and parameters varied much more. One pre-processing step uh, the researchers described was cutting out the second half of each recording, since um, patients typically started running out of breath and having an inconsistent pitch. Um, our model was trained on sustained phonations or making one note with one, one's voice. So we instruct users to do the same. We'll test the model and app on voice recordings from the patient voice analysis data set. Um, our, our app allows us users to record their voice directly into the browser or upload an audio file. After a recording is submitted, uh, the motor PDRS and total scores are displayed. Of course, behind the scenes, the first half is taken, the features are extracted and passed to the model. Uh, we have two samples for the demo. One is male and 45 years old with near the time, to, near the time of recording, um, a total UPDR score of 35. Um, the SNAPS data set did not have motor UPDR scores. And the second is a 65 year old female who had a total score of 29. So um, this is our app. Patients can click uh, this button to start recording or switch the option to upload a file. 
I'll upload the male recording sample, uh, who is 45 years old. Um, the predicted total is uh, 34.6, and the actual is 35. Now we'll try the female sample. Um, she is uh, 65 years old. Prediction is uh, 30.6, while the actual score was 30. So. so conclusion, limitations and future work. With that, there are still some limitations to our model. Our model was only trained on people with Parkinson's, so our app won't be able to properly calculate the UPDRS score for people without Parkinson's and therefore won't be able to serve as an unbiased diagnostic tool. Because of this, if any future work was to be done on this topic, we would suggest training the models on controls as well. We would also try to experiment more with the parameters of our model to increase the R squared scores even further. And these are our references. Thank you. All right, that was group two. I'm gonna check the uh, Q&A, see if we've got more questions. I don't see a question here yet, but I guess to kick things off a little bit, I'm curious. So maybe we talked about this in class, but now I've forgotten. How, how so in the female example, I think it, it was predicting a 30 UPBRS score and the actual result was 25. In practical terms, how how big of a difference is that? Well, the maximum UPTR score is 199, so a difference of like just a few decimal places isn't that big of a difference. Isn't that big? Okay, okay, that's what I, that's what I wanted to know. If it was like, oh, every five, there was a new kind of stage, but th this is wonderful. Okay, cool. All right, other questions? Um, so someone posted, if you had more time, what would you want to do to try to further improve the accuracy? Um, like we mentioned in the presentation, the XG Boost model has like a bunch of different parameters available for us to alter, and we only uh, modified three of those. So if we had more time, we would definitely go back and experiment more of those. Beautiful. Other questions from anybody? Questions can come from within the class too. But I guess you all know each other pretty well. Okay. All right. Thank you, group number two. We've been going from six down to two, and now we are at our final group presenting, which is group number one. They will be doing a live presentation if they're all still with us. So without further ado, I'll hand it off to group number one. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Bonafide. So today we'll be discussing about diagnosing osteosarcoma. Let's meet the team. Hello, my name is Aaron Kim. My name is Ayushi Mohanty. My name is Arsh Boinka. And we have David. I'm not sure. We have David, but apparently he likes silence. So um, I'm the last one. I'm Neil Sash. So there's some slight issues with David's audio, but while he figures that out, let's just talk about osteosarcoma. So osteosarcoma is a type of bone cancer, which is commonly found in the long bones around the knees. And the survival rate for osteosarcoma is dependent on a lot of different factors, especially the spread of the cancer. That's why early detection is incredibly important. As we can see on the next slide, we'll be talking about why that's slightly more important. So on a global basis, there's about 3.4 million people who suffer from osteosarcoma every single year. What's incredibly important about this is that it metastasizes incredibly quickly, which poses a lot of issues for treatment and recovery. So it's incredibly important to diagnose osteosarcoma really early. That way it can be caught and treated because there's much higher rate of treatment when it's diagnosed earlier. But if it metastasizes to the lungs or it spreads to the brain, then it can become really difficult to treat. So diagnosis. Diagnosis for osteosarcoma takes a lot. You have to take a blood test, x-ray, CTs, MRIs, including bone scans, ET scans, and a biopsy. So after all of this, it can be really difficult to diagnose and would take a lot of time. And by that time, it's possible that the cancer could have spread. Additionally, there's a lot of treatment options. So surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation therapy. But it won't be, you know, a person can't be treated until they're diagnosed. So what is the problem? The problem is that prognosis is difficult. As mentioned before, it requires a lot of history taking, a lot of examinations, and 
MRI scans in and of itself are quite expensive and they have a limiting a limited detecting capacity. Additionally, when pathologists take these histological images or images of the tissues in our body, they aren't able to detect the nuances and it's incredibly challenging for them to diagnose just from that image. However, our group, Bonafide, has come up with a solution. We wish to create a machine learning model that diagnoses osteosarcoma given histological images. So straight from these images of tissues, we will be able to identify whether or not a person has osteosarcoma and whether or not it can be operable on. So our data set. We use the Cancer Imaging Archive, which is a very credible set that has collected images from the UT Southwestern Medical Center, and it takes H&E stained osteosarcoma histological images, or images of different tissues in our legs, and there's 50 archived samples from patients at the Children's Medical Center in Dallas, ranging several years. So our data set consists of 1,144 histological images, each with the size of 1,024 by 1,024. And each image falls under one of three classes, a non-tumor, meaning there is no tumor, a necrotic tumor, meaning the tumor cannot be operated on, and a viable tumor, meaning that the tumor can, the tumor can be operated on. So for data pre-processing, the first step was to correct the CSV files with the annotations for our data, because some of the files have the same annotation multiple times. Next, we had to take the unordered images, which we converted into NumPy arrays, and the annotations from the CSV files, and put them into the same order so each label matched with the image it was associated with. Lastly, we had to split our data into train, test, and validation sets. For, Im for image resizing, we took our original image and shrunk it down to a size of 100 by 100 pixels. So the split we chose for our data was 63% for training, 18% for validation, and 19% for testing. So our binary classifier consisted of two outcomes, being either osteosarcomal positive, which consisted of the viable and necrotic tumors, or being osteosarcoma negative, which consisted of the non-tumors. While our multi-class classifier consisted of the same classes as we were given. To solve our problem, we decided to use machine learning and more specifically transfer learning, which is basically when you take a pre-trained model that has been trained on millions of images and then train it using your own data set so that, so that it uses the previous knowledge it gained from training on the huge data set of images and the knowledge it gets from training on your data set to more quickly make a very accurate model. So for our case, we chose the DenseNet 121 pre-trained model for our binary classifier in the Inception V3 pre-trained model for our multi-class classifier. Uh, is my audio working? Yeah. Oh, David, go. Is uh, So you can hear me right now? OK. Um, so as the table shows, our, bi our binary model had a total of over 7 million parameters. As I will allude to in the next slide, the model consisted of four hidden layers, one pooling layer, which reduces the sample size of the data and one dropout layer. We played around with the number of types of layers and the model configuration shown here is the one that produced the best results. So uh, we explored four hyperparameters in our model. Hyperparameters are parameters used to control the learning process in machine learning algorithms. For the dropout layer, which prevents overfitting on the training data by randomly removing some nodes in the hidden layer we had a value of 0.5. Next, we used the ReLU and SoftMax activation functions. Activation functions are functions that determine whether a node in the neural network should relay a signal to the next layer given certain inputs. We then used the Atom Max optimizer for correcting the model as it was learning. And finally, we set the learning rate to 0.0001, the value at which the model would adjust its weights at each node every time it calculated the loss between the predicted and actual results. And after a lot of fine tuning with the hyperparameters in the model, the binary model had an accuracy of 98.60%. The two metrics we used to evaluate the model were the ROC curve and the confusion matrix. Our model had an ROC score of 0 0.986 
out of one. The ROC curve measures the accuracy of the model by looking at the true positive rate, which is how often the model correctly predicted a positive result, and the false positive rate, which is the frequency with which the model incorrectly predicted a value was positive when it was actually negative. The confusion matrix on the right produced results as good as the ROC curve. The confusion matrix plots the true labels against the predicted labels. In it, the top left corner and the bottom right corner should be maximized, while the bottom left corner and the top right corner should be minimized. As the slide shows, our model performed very well in this test. In addition to our binary model, we also made a multi-class model. A multi-class model means that the classification was categorizing data and forming groups based on similarity. Now below, you can see each of the layers we used for the multi-class model, including things like a pooling layer and a dropout layer. In addition, we also used Inception V3, an image recognition model, which also caused our parameters to increase greatly, three times as much, up to 21 million parameters. Our next uh, slide is about our multi-class model hyperparameters. This is very similar to our binary hyperparameters. As you can see, we have a dropout activation optimizer and learning rate. And below, you can see each of the hyperparameters for that layer. With this, we ended up with a multi-class model accuracy of 92.56%. Though not as high as the binary model, this is still incredibly high and provides a fast and accurate result for diagnosing osteosarcoma. Now here we again have an area under the curve and confusion matrix. The multi-class uh, classifier for the area under the curve is 0 0.978. And once again, we see that the area under the curve and the confusion matrix scores are matching, which reinforces the validity and the high accuracy of the model, which allows us to be confident that we are making the right diagnosis using our model. And now we would like to present to you our web app demonstration. OK, so as you can see, we are able to um, classify our models with either binary or multi-class. And right here, we can put in any file image we want of the data. And after, give it a few seconds, it will be able to uh, accurately predict the diagnosis of osteosarcoma. As we can see, this process, while highly accurate, is also incredibly fast, right? Which is very important for diagnosis. And this poses a great thing for pathologists to use in the lab anytime that they're scanning any images. They can directly put it into this predictor and boom. Yeah, so right here, our binary model um, predicted osteosarcoma positive, and we can see the confidence percentage right here at the bottom. So in addition to using a binary model, clinicians also have the option to choose a multi-class model. This can be helpful because in addition to only uh, classify by uh, detecting the image to either be have a tumor or not, they can also see whether or not the tumor is operable. So as you can see, this tumor is a viable tumor, meaning that it is operable. And this can be really important when a clinician is deciding whether to operate on a patient or not. Yeah, so future developments we like to do with this project is first to fully fledge out our web app and be able to um, utilize this model for clinicians and pathologists around the world to be able to help their diagnoses. Uh, in addition, we'd like to also write a research paper that would um, further advance the study of osteosarcoma and advance our project for the future. And finally, we'd like to find uh, greater data sets which would help um, improve the model's accuracy and expand the data sets to be um, global. So a few key takeaways here is that data matters a lot. So First was the issue of whether we had enough data or not. And if there was not enough or a sufficient amount of data, then a model would not have had that high of an accuracy as we uh, would have. And also we had to research thoroughly about the subject at hand and really understand our data. Um, how is the data organized? And that's how what we that was really important during the pre-processing phase. And that's what allowed us to efficiently work through the project step by step. And finally is to plan for our setbacks. So always have a backup plan, always be able to uh, learn from each other and as a group be able to tackle on any obstacle in our way and finally we uh, recorded our process during the whole project and we were able to look back at our setbacks but also uh, overcome and watch our success in the end 
So we like to go over a brief, um, briefly about our original setback, which was an initial idea to create a model that would be able to predict the severity of Parkinson's disease for various regions of the body. And this would have been done by convolutional pose machines. And uh, patients would have done specific tasks such as communication or drinking uh, water or even toe tapping. So the way this would work is that um, the data set recorded the trajectory of the body's movements. And using those trajectories, we would, we would have been able to extract features and find uh, predict the degree of Parkinsonism and dyskinesia severity within patients. And the issue here was that there was just not enough data. So in the future, we'd like to find a data set that would be able to uh, allow us to work on this project. And thank you. We'll now open the floor for questions. Thank you all for questions. All right, let's see if there's anything on the uh, live stream. Yeah, I, I for one, I'm happy you guys included the uh, the bit about your initial uh, work on the pose estimation because that, that, that was a really cool, cool, cool idea. I guess with more data around, that would have been, it could be a whole thesis. All right, questions for group one. We have just about four minutes in the entirety of the session. Any questions people ask will offset Christian waxing poetic about what a wonderful summer this was. So speak now or forever hold your peace. We'll keep our secrets then, I guess. <laughs> uh, right, yeah. <laughs> the universe are ours. <laughs> How much thermal paste did you use on your computer when training the model? Uh, the, real, the real numbers. I used to be so obsessed with thermal paste. Okay. All right, everybody. Well, if that's, uh, if that's all we've got, um, I'll say, you know, the, the TY word again for the millionth time. Thank you. Um, you know, you guys have kind of painted my July. It's going to feel weird going back to the, uh, the day job after this. Marsha's computer is cracked, probably trained in like a couple of minutes, right? <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, you guys. Um, great. Any, any closing remarks? Anything you want to say to your parents? Hi, mom, right? There you go. You're on the live stream. Um, we have... We have three minutes, I think, before the main session. We go back to the main session. I mean, I feel like the obvious thing is to thank you. You have been a brilliant instructor this entire time and have really made this course something special and really brightened up all of our summers. And I want to thank you for that. And we all want to thank you for that. Yeah, thank I you. Think <laughs> in this summer, if we so did much. not have this course, I mean, I don't know, we'd just be drowning and other stuff but you've really made this enjoyable and you've taught us so much I think you know I started off this course without knowing too much really just the prerequisites just making my brain go haywire but then you put everything in perspective and doing these projects with your help has really just you know opened my mind to what we can do I appreciate it I stand on the shoulders of giants though Skylar's also here I don't know if you have your face on this Skylar but please throw Skylar a round of applause as well and all the other staff as well because uh, Christian's life is so chaotic that uh, it wouldn't work out if it was just Christian. <laughs> Someone Rickroll the live stream. Oh, no. Yes. Oh, Rickroll, but alternative link. That's funny. Anyhow. All right, you guys. Well, for the last time as a group, I will say goodbye. But again, goodbye is not the end. It simply means I'll miss you till we meet again. So be in touch. Take care. And I'll see you at the main round of presentations later this afternoon. What is Tal doing? Look at Tal, it says. Oh, no, he's not doing anything. Oh. <laughs> Wait, I want to jump in, but also, like, this was the best summer learning experience I've had. So thank you, Christian, and to all the TAs. Yeah, thank, thanks, Catherine. No, it's fun. I always, learn, I always learn a lot more. Like, this class kind of runs itself because you guys are so brilliant. So, again, I will accept the, the thank yous humbly, but I will say you guys are such a big part of that. You know, don't ever, don't ever think you're not, you know, um, this and everything else, too. You guys are going to be a force to be reckoned with. Remember to be, keep being the very cool people that you are. <laughs>